All right, it's 6.30. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this community conversation with Silvio Moreno Garcia. Uh, my name is Adolfo Bejarlara and I am a faculty member at SUNY New Paltz. Uh, before we begin though, I just want to thank the staff here at the Newburgh Free Library for all the work they put in, to organize this event tonight. Especially I want to thank uh, Yoli Abella, Patty Sussman and Chris Price uh, their enthusiasm and commitment to working with community here at the, at the New York Free Library is very inspiring. You know, they're always committed to provide services and to make literature and books accessible to everyone. And I really admire them for the work that they put into this mission. Um, I want to talk to you about our guest today. Uh, Silvia Moreno Garcia is the author of eight books including the critically acclaimed uh, novels, Mexican Gothic and Velvet Was the Night, right? Which by the way, are available here at the library if you wanna check them out. Uh, we have them in the catalog, uh, along many other books by uh, Silvia Moreno Garcia. Silvia Moreno Garcia's work inhabits multiple genres, including horror, science fiction, fantasy, and historical fiction. In her latest book, The Daughter of Dr. Moral, for example, Silvia Moreno Garcia crafts a novel that explores the relationship between the human and animal world and invites readers to reflect on historical and contemporary social issues that arise from colonialism, classism, and sexism through the lens of fantasy and historical fiction. Her distinctive style, characteristic for its unique way of crafting narratives that are both thrilling and complex, makes Silvia Moreno Garcia, in my opinion, one of the leading voices of contemporary Latina and Latin American literature. Please help me welcome Silvia Moreno Garcia. Thank you, Silvia, for joining us tonight. We're really, really thrilled to have you here in this conversation with the community here at the New York Free Library. Um, as I was mentioning earlier when we were talking, the idea is to have an open conversation with the community. So I will start the conversation, but I want to invite um, those who are joining us virtually to send us your questions through the chat so that we can have a conversation, an open conversation with Sylvia um, to get to know her and her work and you know build community because ultimately that's what we're interested in here building community through reading and the literature and literacy. Um, so, Silvia, again, thank you for joining me. So you recently published The Daughter of Dr. Moreau's, uh, this incredible book and a wonderful story about, again, the limits and the relationship between the human and animal world where you're exploring uh, the tensions that arise uh, in regards to colonialism, classism, sexism, uh, with the backdrop of the Mestizo War in, in Mexico. And I was just wondering if you could talk to us about the inspiration behind uh, the daughter of Dr. Moros. What were some of the ideas, some of the themes that you were thinking about as you were writing this book? <laughs> Thank you very much for having me over. I hope uh, you can hear me okay. Yeah, all right. Uh, well, The Daughter of Dr. Moreau is a loose um, reimagining, or we could say it's uh, loosely inspired by the 19th century novella, The Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Wells, which was written at the end of the 19th century. It is a work that exists before the classification that we now call science fiction begins to be as it is. So in the time of Wells, when he's writing, what he is creating are scientific romances. That's the term for it. And there isn't quite the boundary making that we find now with genre, with science fiction specifically, because this is an emerging category that is simply taking shape around that time period. So obviously, uh, some of the ideas that Wells is handling in the novel, which include uh, the intersection between science and society, um, man and animal, appear in that novella and are used again in my work, but in a completely different way because the setting is changed to 
the 19th century Yucatan Peninsula, where the uh, Guerra de Castas, the case war, was taking place during that time period. And this was a long, very long conflict in that area in which the indigenous people of the area, the Maya, were in a violent conflict with the Mexican population and also from the European descended population. Um, so both mestizos and uh, what we would call criollos, creoles, uh, were, were in conflict at that point in time. And so this informs the background of the, of the novel. Another aspect that is perhaps not as obvious, but when I was writing it, it was, it was, a, it was a big inspiration and um, I didn't mention it in the back note because I was in a rush, but I probably should have, was that another big source of inspiration was the work of Ignacio Manuel Altamirano, who was a 19th century Mexican writer. And he's considered the father of the Mexican novel because he produces what we call nowadays the first modern Mexican novel. In the 19th century, most of the fiction that is being consumed in all of Latin America is coming imported from Spain. Once independence movements happen all throughout um, Latin America, there is also a movement to try and create a different kind of literature that is maybe not dependent on just importing texts from Spain. And Ignacio Manuel Altamirano comes up with a book that's called Clemencia and is a romance. It's, a, it's really a romance square, not even a triangle, but a square. And it's what was called at the time a sentimental novel, what we might call nowadays a historical romance or slash drama. And the reason why it's um, interesting is because Ignacio Manuel de Mirano is taking a popular form of European type of writing, uh, the uh, type of romance that he's trying to imitate, but he's localizing it and setting it in Mexico. And by doing that, he basically modifies a formula in a way that it creates something new that we haven't quite seen before in Mexico. And this is also happening and being echoed in other parts of Latin America where other authors are coming up with their own um, kind of uh, romance or adventure narratives that are heavily inspired by people like Sir Walter Scott or others, but they are anchoring them in Latin America. And in doing that localization, again, something is happening to literature and it is the proto literature of, of Mexico, of Latin America that you're seeing emerging there. So I was looking at two different strands of literature that are poised at a point in time in which things are shifting. Boundaries are kind of being discovered, haven't quite been discovered or drawn. Things are taking shape and are sort of amorphous. So you're looking at the beginning of science fiction and then you're looking at the beginning of Latin American fiction. And that's what I was trying to um, kind of go back to and play with were some of these two dual narratives. And I really feel that the novel accomplishes that by bringing these two emerging genres together and allowing for something completely new to emerge, which I think is, uh, I think one of my favorite things about this novel, right? Bringing this historical fiction, this scientific kind of lens in conversation with this romantic novel. And I, I think you kind of already answered part of my follow up question, which was um, what kind of research do you conduct when, you know, thinking about a book? And more specifically, I, I was thinking how much does the research that you're doing or conducting tell you what you need to be writing and how much the writing that you're doing tells you what you need to be researching. And if you know there's a balance in that or, or how do you go about that when writing and thinking about what you're writing? Yeah, there's a, um, I call it textual research, which is when I go and I look at, uh, if I'm looking at a genre that I'm trying to play with or imitate or uh, reimagine like Mexican Gothic or like the daughter of Dr. Moreau, I'm going back and I'm reading a lot of fiction from that era that falls in that category. So I didn't only read The Island of Dr. Moreau, it was one of the books from the time period that I read, but I read some other stuff that falls in that kind of early science fiction mode. Um, and Wells was obviously a cornerstone for that work. Um, with Mexican Gothic, I read a lot of Gothic fiction 
And some I reread, some were things that I have already read and that I would be reading again and refreshing my mind. And other stuff was stuff that I hadn't tackled before and that I was looking at for the first time. So I, I hadn't read, for example, Dragon Wick, which is an early Gothic romance of the 20th century. And I, I looked at that when I was looking at Mexican Gothic and kind of seeing how people are writing in that time period and what their concerns are, how, how that is working on the page. And then comes the, the historical research. In the case of the daughter of Dr. Moreau, I had a really good grounding and understanding of 19th century uh, Yucatan and the conflict that is happening there. But I went and looked even deeper and looked at other aspects and things that I hadn't uh, thought about. There's all the mega aspects and then there's all the small aspects of things like um, you know, how much did something cost in such and such year and uh, and all that kind of stuff versus the mega aspects of what's the political situation in a certain time period and region, what's, what's going on here. So in the case of Moreau, I was looking um, a lot about, um, you know, papers and uh, books that have been written about the case war, about Yucatan. I was also looking at primary sources. I was looking about stuff that was written during the time period about what is happening in the region, both from foreigners and from locals. So obviously when you have a conflict going on, this is being reported in newspapers and magazines of the time, and you're seeing what people are thinking in this time and what they're saying. And it, and it becomes very interesting to see what you're saying when you're in the time period and later, you know, when we kind of analyze it more than a hundred years later, how you're thinking about it. So there's some of that going on, map research to see what things look like uh, from above in terms of topography, in terms of uh, uh, flora, fauna, what's growing in that area, all that kind of stuff. And um, the uh, kind of research that I do is always, I always say it's capillaring um, is what I call it. You do enough research until you think that you've eaten enough information and you can turn into a butterfly. So some people that I know, they do too much research and they don't know when to stop. And so they don't really write anything. And I, when I'm at a point in which I feel comfortable, I start writing and I'm still doing research normally in tandem with that. So I've read a bunch of books, but I'm maybe reading even more books or if I find another source, which happens really um, uh, commonly for me, I just found three more sources of something that I'm working on right now. And I read them uh, last week and, and I might, might or might not use any of that for what I'm working on right now. But as I'm working, I'm still reading and doing some of this work. But I already have, I think, a solid foundation. And then I kind of uh, build up on, on top of that. But so, yeah, I caterpillar it. And I, I do like to um, read stuff that was published in the time period, if it's available, if there was writing in that time period. So I did read a lot of 19th century stuff, like I said, at the Miran and some other people. And um, when I've been in a time period in which there's visual media, I might be looking at things like movies that were in the time period or bits of film or TV reporting or photographs or all that kind of stuff. In this case, there were no movies, but I was looking at fashion plates because there were fashion, the beginning of fashion magazines believe, uh, begins kind of in the late 1800s. And so you do have a really wide collection of uh, fashion magazines and fashion plates that allow you to see more or less how people are dressed, uh, what's fashionable in the time period. And then there's obviously uh, other types of art uh, like uh, paintings. And if you go to a museum and you see some of the artifacts that might have been used in a certain time period, then you could get an idea of well, uh, how people maybe adorn their homes or all that kind of stuff. But that's part of the part of the work. And depending on the work, it depends how heavy it leans towards one type of research or the other. Um, so some periods of time have a lot of, have been studied quite a bit. And so there's a lot of research that is easily available and others have not. And so it becomes a bit more excavation. That's great. I really, I really like the metaphor of the caterpillar because that's the chicken and the egg situation, right? You, when do you know that you know enough so that you can write something? And I find it very illuminating that you use that uh, metaphor and, and you become a butterfly and you feel like you can finally write. Uh, I have one last question before I open the microphone to the community. And I was thinking 
about what is it that draws you um, to write at the crossroads of you know science fiction, fantasy, historical fiction, horror, right? In other words, what do these genres allow you to do when you conceptualize a book or when you're thinking about the story that you want to tell that perhaps another genre might not allow you to? Um, in the best of cases, they give you a certain aesthetic freedom and they eliminate certain boundaries that might be present in other kind of situations in the best um, case scenario. So in the case of something like, uh, you know, The Daughter of Dr. Moreau, you can read a, a book about uh, the case war in the Yucatan and and get a really good understanding of what's happening in the time period. And that's and that's fine. And I hope people do kind of do a little bit of that research, but you can absorb um, a different sort of narrative just uh, by reading a, a fiction novel, I think. And it becomes a, a sort of different experience. And just like, um, for example, uh, watching a music video or listening to an opera produces a different reaction in, in the viewer, um, uh, experiencing, for me, uh, writing fiction that tends to overlap boundaries produces a very specific reaction in me um, and uh, brings, a, I don't know, a sense of happiness or joy that maybe would not be present if I was trying to do things in a completely realist manner most of the times. Um, you know, removing some of those um, maybe genre elements that exist in the periphery, I think would make it a little bit uh, drier for yeah. my taste. So the thing that I love about operas, for example, is that uh, they're very big, right? And everybody's breaking into song and, and it's very dramatic. And so you can express really big emotions in a very visible and visceral way that you can't if I was, if you were doing it maybe, maybe as a stage play without any music and that kind of stuff. And, and so I feel that it's the same thing with uh, some of the genres that I enjoy, that I have played with and that I like to kind of poke at is that uh, they give you a different and enhanced experience that if I was doing just a straight historical novel, which I could have done, you know, I could have done a straight historical novel, but it just, I think it, it makes it a little bit better in, in my opinion, or I have, I have more fun doing that, but I am very drawn to all kinds of different media and what each one can do um, for you. And so, yeah, so it's, you know, like an opera or a music video, they can do certain things that nothing else can quite uh, sort of do for you. If you, if you do it right, it cannot be repl replicated in another form. And for me, it's like, if I do it right, um, the genre really gives you a different flavor than just a straight drama would give you. I, 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 wanna, I wanna just say that I really like this idea of joy, right? That these genres bring you joy. And I think that's important because I believe that the best forms of imagination happen when we're experiencing joy. And so if this is important to you, uh, I think uh, it makes a lot of sense that, you know, going to science fiction, fantasy, is the place where you feel that you can experience this joy. And I agree with what you said, I think these genres are unique in what they allow you to do and what they allow you to explore. I want to open the conversation to the community. Um, you can perhaps try to unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, and if you don't feel like you want to mute and ask a question on the microphone, you can also write it on the chat. Uh, so take it away. This is a great opportunity to talk to Sylvia uh, about any of her books or particularly The Daughter of Dr. Moral. And let me know if you can't unmute yourself and so we can try to figure that out. Yeah. Or you can type. <laughs> That's right. Any questions? Anything really, right? This is just a conversation uh, to get to know Sylvia and her work or to ask any questions that you might have about books that you've read. 
from her. It was a little mute. Oh. So let's, let's see if we can figure that out. I think we might want to go to. We're going to have to go to settings. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Samantha. Hi. Yes. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, because I read Mexican Gothic and then I read um, Velvet Was a Night, which I love, but they were so different. Um, so like, how do you get these ideas? Like, do you know, are you just like watching something or, you know, they're just so different. I love it. Um, sometimes they are... Uh, personal exercises. So with certain work, sometimes I want to see if I can do it. And I'll think about a specific genre or sort of category and see if I can do it. That was the case with something like The Return of the Sorceress. And that's a novella that I published, I think, maybe two years ago. And that is my take on sword and sorcery. So I really liked uh, sword and sorcery, which was quite popular in the early 20th century. And you had figures like Conan the Barbarian emerging out of that. And then in the 1960s, there was kind of a mini revival and you had people like Michael Moorcock doing Elric of Mel Bonnet and a few others. And nowadays it's not really popular anymore, but I wanted to go back to those sword and sorcery fantasy stories. Um, and they were stories. They generally tended not to be novels, but short stories uh, meant for the magazine market and write something that might, um, be considered sword and sorcery. So I wrote a novella and that's why it's it's that short. It was supposed to be short and punchy. And so that was setting myself to see if I could do it. It was it was an exercise in uh, uh, kind of trying something out, like, like a painter tries a different technique. For something like Signal to Noise, which was my debut, that was a book that I wasn't sure how to classify and my publisher is still to this day not sure how to classify and you know, that I think unsureness is reflected in the fact that it's had now three different covers. And um, and it is a book that is hard to define because it's straddle categories. It's not one, it's not, it's neither fish nor fowl. So that one was not an exercise where I was specifically interested in doing that. It just came out like that. And then we were kind of caught in how do we uh, specifically define this? What is this thing that has been made? which happens when you cook sometimes. Sometimes you follow a recipe and other times you get in the kitchen with, you see what you have left and you make something out of it and it comes out like that. And that was signal to noise. Um, but I do like to genre jump and to switch a lot between one thing and the other. Um, Velvet was a night. I wrote another noir before that, Untamed Shore and Velvet was a night. I really like noirs. I wanted to get out of speculative fiction, science fiction, fantasy, and horror. I wanted to move away from that and move for a little bit into the space of the noir for a variety of reasons. But one of them was um, that aesthetically I was feeling a little bit tired with what I, what I had been doing before. So I wanted to uh, try something like that. And that was... Um, quite interesting. It does create um, a series of marketing problems and concerns for the editorial team and the marketing team, because it is not that common nowadays for a writer to genre jump from one title to the other. So in terms of marketing and sales, it, uh, it makes it a little bit of a, a more perilous position, but I've done it quite a few times now. And I think at least for now, I, I have a publishing house that seems to like me enough that they will allow me to continue to do that in at least in the next little bit with the books that I have under contract with them, which is a couple more. So, yeah. Well, thank you for that. Julia. Anybody else? And if you can't unmute yourself, you can you can type or maybe draw attention to yourself because I think um, uh, this system doesn't really allow you to click on the mic and and do it for yourself. Well, I was thinking that maybe well, somebody um, you know figures that out or is thinking about a question. If you could tell us a little bit about your background as a writer, and if you could you know tell us a little bit about the journey to where you are now. Uh, you know, your publications and then what it took 
to be here now uh, with such a successful catalog of books. Uh, so my first sale was about 16 years ago, and I started selling in very, very small markets. Uh, my first sale was for $10 for a magazine that was called Shimmer. I mainly sold short stories in the, what is called the pro, not, not the pro scene, but the fan, fan scene and semi-pro zine format, which are, yeah, $10, 20 bucks, not, not a very big uh, um, kind of market in the old days. It would have been magazines that were Xerox and photocopied and passed around like that. And in the era in where I, in which I started, the internet was already, you know, a thing. So it was mostly online markets and and that kind of stuff. So I published a lot of short fiction in from when I started in two thousand six and in the years later, about over seventy stories, mostly to very small markets, like I said. Um, and then. And I also kind of started publishing some of my stuff on my own and editing stuff on my own until in 2013, I think, I had a short story collection published, my first short story collection, because I had amassed a wide body of, of work and I won a Canadian contest uh, for a short story. And so the magazine that published that story offered me a contract with a with a collection. And so they were a small, independent Canadian Pub, you know, publisher. So that came out and that, you know, didn't break sales records or anything like that, but I had now a collection and I wanted to shift from short story writing into writing novels um, for a variety of reasons. And so I started doing, I had, I was doing that and, and just writing several novels and sending out proposals. And until eventually I got my first novel published, it was, it was called Signal to Noise and that came out I believe in 2015, if I'm not mistaken, with a British publisher, an independent British publisher, yeah, you know, did okay and all that. And then we, I had an agent at that point, I acquired an agent during that process of getting that first book out. And my agent was trying to get me a contract with a different publisher. And we ended up with a publisher called Thomas Dunn Books, which gave me a two book contract. And the two books came out and Thomas Dunn promptly closed down. So it was a really a very weird period. Uh, first, my editor left and I was shuffled between a bunch of different editors and then the publisher finally closed down. So it, it closed down. And so now you're out of print, you know, almost immediately upon being publisher out of print and you don't have a publisher and you don't have anything. So then again, my agent and I were like, OK, let's do the rounds again. And that's. Um, when we ended up publishing Gods of Jade and Shadow and later on Mexican Gothic with Pink and Random House. And I started developing a relationship with Penguin Random House. Um, but, you know, my story is basically of publisher jumping. I've had a lot of different publishers. Um, not everything of mine has come out from Penguin Random House, even though they've published several books of mine. I have had in between periods where I've done stuff with other people because it didn't work for Penguin Random House or um, I just went with somebody else for some other reason. And so there's been a lot of genre shifting and uh, publishing shifting and just bouncing around in many capacities throughout, uh, um, throughout my career. And also a lot of um, different roles that are not necessarily writer. Like I said, I've edited, uh, short fiction, uh, a magazine, and several anthologies, guest edited for some stuff. I've written nonfiction pieces, articles, posts. I used to have a column in the Washington Post, which I'm not doing anymore as of this summer, but I used to have that as a co-columnist with somebody. Um, so all these kinds of different roles and different things and a lot of uh, jumping between, between spaces and a lot of constant morphing of not only my genre, but uh, other aspects of my, of my career. And so it's, um, you know, it, it's a different kind of experience being a writer in this time period than it would have been a different kind of experience being a writer in the pulp era or in the 1980s or in the 1960s, uh, when people who I know who are, 
who are older tell me how it was in the how it was in the 1980s. I'm like, damn, why wasn't I there? That's when all the big lunches took place. Um, that's when you could make like a huge amount of money in certain categories, and yeah, they would fly you in and put you on tour and all that kind of stuff. And you know, I exist in a different kind of time period, and it's just interesting to see the era where I live in. And I think uh, being nimble and flexible is what keeps you alive in this in this time period of of writing as a um as a published author who wants to make a living being a writer freelancing as a writer you just bounce around a lot in a lot of different aspects of writing thank you for sharing that story because i think as readers we assume that writers have a linear you know trajectory of their career where they just start writing and somehow they just the writers lose and they just, you know, become accomplished writers. And hearing your story and, you know, trial and error and trying different publishers and editors and moving from one to the other and, you know, the, what it took to get to where you are, I think it's, it's inspiring. So thank you for sharing that. We have a question in the chat um, that says, and I think it's by Doris Chu, who's uh, saying hi. I really enjoy Gossip Jade and Shadow as well as Mexican Gothic. Out of all of the books that you've written, did you have a favorite? Was there one that was the most fun to write? It normally is the latest thing I'm doing. It's probably the most fun I'm having at, the, at that point in time. But I really had, I think a good time writing on Tame Shore, and that was a noir, a very slim little noir that I wrote a few years ago, because it's set in Baja California, which is where I'm from, and um, it has a lot of descriptions of the landscape, and I really sort of enjoyed that. If I could have written a uh, hundred pages just about the landscape without plot, I would probably have done that, and that that book is probably the closest that I'm ever going to get to that. So I quite um, I quite kind of liked uh, that experience. But each one is kind of unique and fun in its own way. Some of it is because the research is fun and some of it is just because um, the things that you're getting to deploy are fun. Like for Mexican Gothic, it was fun to uh, play with a lot of tropes that I had grown up reading and that now employing them like the big dark house and the dangerous Byronic man and all this kind of stuff. So that was just fun kind of getting into that mode, but, uh, but it's always fun. I mean, uh, if, if it wasn't fun, I wouldn't be doing it after such a long time because it's, there's other professions that you can do where you have immediate rewards rather than writing. And, and so this is really not, uh, kind of something that is very good if you're one of those people that likes immediate rewards you want to put a coin in and a and a little toy comes out um so yeah but uh, but i find rewarding it in in some kind of other uh in some kind of other way thank you doris thanks for the question um, any other questions i have a question what yes uh knowing me and carlota uh two women who struggled uh, with the uh, mold of what a woman should act, how a woman should act, how they should uh, react. Uh, writing a book, let's say today, any differences on the struggle of a woman with that, um, the way they should act, how society views women, uh, especially in a Latin American countries culture? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it would be different to write a contemporary, completely realist in Mexico, for example, or in other parts of Latin America and in, say, the United States or Canada. It's, it's just a completely different culture. Um, and especially if you're talking rural versus urban, that kind of stuff. So it's not the same, definitely, living in a really small town in Puebla than in New York City. And, and I think sometimes people kind of forget those differences. There's this assumption that everybody has the same kind of freedoms and possibilities at every point in time. And that's not true in every uh, sort of situation. So, although I think it would be a different experience than what somebody's facing in the 1950s in Mexico as a woman, 
in 2022, it's not like it's all gravy for every woman everywhere at every point in, in their life and in every nation, but, uh, oh, sorry. That's my phone. <laughs> I don't know who's calling me. And I don't know where my phone is physically right now. So you're just gonna let it ring. Um, yeah, sorry. But a lot of the stuff that I'm sometimes going back to is, is the experience of women's in my own family, right? So with um, somebody like Noemi Tawada, um, in, my grandmother, who was a young woman in the kind of 1940s and yeah, kind of mid 1940s, she couldn't go to, she wanted to go to medical school and she couldn't go because she, her family didn't have enough money. But also her father said she would not be allowed to go, even if by some miracle they got the money, because uh, it would mean that she would go to class with men. Right. So she she would not be allowed to go to to classes with men. And I was just reading a book about um, one of the very first hotels. And it was in New York that had women guests. So you could be, before that, you had to go to a guest house or stay with a friend and that kind of stuff. And suddenly there's this hotel in, in New York where Sylvia Plath stayed, for example, where you could go and room and live. And this was a huge change change maker in the 1940s and 1950s and into the 1960s because women didn't have that kind of mobility and nowadays you probably don't think about that like what do you mean women that didn't have that kind of mobility but women single women could not check into a hotel by themselves and therefore travel in the same way that a guy could and those, so those kinds of considerations uh, when I'm writing women in a different time period I try to bring them in and not um create a world in which I, I never like it when when there's some kind of historical like thing and um somebody is like well it's the 1920s and I'm behaving just like a woman in um in 2022 there are certain restrictions and ways of thinking that I try to keep in the background and although I'm trying to please a modern audience also making sure that it's not so divorced from the reality and experience that somebody might have had in that time period that I'm wondering like would that have ever happened probably not uh, but yeah so uh, in terms of history I do try to think of uh, what the context might have been and what kind of restrictions or freedoms women of different classes and different places might have faced. Um, we have another question by, if I'm not mistaken, from the list by Samantha, who's asking, it sounds, or is saying, it sounds like you have to do a lot of research and reading for your work. Did you get much time to read recreationally any book recommendations? I haven't traditionally had a lot of time to read recreationally because I was uh, not only doing my own research, but I was writing this column for the Washington Post. And the reason why I stopped doing it was because I had no more time for reading the things that I wanted to read on my own, to be honest. And so I was just kind of reading to keep up with the column and it became a hamster wheel situation where I was just going around running, trying to read enough books for the next column. So normally I have been reading in order to achieve something related to work kind of. And when I read recreationally, it has become odder and odder, uh, an odder situation. But um, I do still manage to squeeze in some things once in a while. My, the things that I, like to read for myself are not necessarily the things that I think many other people would be reading. So it's sometimes an odd uh, sort of reading for fun uh, kind of kind of situation. Uh, in terms of book recommendations, I always say that the best thing to do is go talk to your local librarian, tell them what you like and see uh, what they say because everybody's very different. And um, but if you are interested in speculative fiction from Latin American authors or La authors with a Latin American heritage, um, I did publish a list in this month in October 
together with Ofra Daily, and it offered a bunch of different books, and you can look it out if you Google Ofra Daily, Sylvia, Hispanic Heritage, it should pop up. And I mentioned people like uh, Samantha Shrevelin, who wrote Fever Dream, which is a novella, and uh, Amparo Davila, who wrote The House Guest and Other Stories, and that's a collection of short stories by a Mexican writer that wrote sort of suspense in the Shirley Jackson mode. So there's that one. And I also have things like um, Tears of the Truffle Pig by Fernando Arturo Flores. And he's a Mexican-American author who did this science fiction novel a few years ago that feels a little bit like the work of Philip K. Dick or Jeff Bandermeer. So if you write, if you like any or either one of those authors, then you can check Flores and he's doing something that's set around the border zone. It's quite interesting. So I have, I do have that, that list that you can check out. And I've written other lists and published them in other places through time, but this was just for Hispanic Heritage Month and I was discussing speculative fiction. But definitely see what your librarian or uh, nice bookstore employee suggests and what they have in their collections in terms of Hispanic stuff, they often don't get as much attention as they should, or they get attention for one month of the year. So it's always good to see what is in the library and checking it out because it actually tells the library system that uh, people are reading it and, and looking at it. Yeah, we had a message of one of the audience from the question is, we could share the link, and I think Samantha did the favor of sharing that. Okay, yeah. So thank you, Samantha. Appreciate it. Any other questions for Silvia? Okay, oh, well, there's, there's there's a hand, a little hand over there. Argelia? I have a question, Ophelia. It's like a clap. It's like saying thank oh, you. Oh, okay. It's a clap. <laughs> <Sorry>. Okay. <laughs> you're okay. You're okay. Uh, I did. I, I did have a question. Like I said, I wanted to go back to something you said about how once a writer starts publishing a genre, it's really difficult to switch mm -hmm. it down. I think the fact that you were able to do that speaks to your talent. Uh, and six volumes of who you are as a writer. But I was wondering, in kind of that same line of thought, if do you feel that there are certain expectations of what a Latina, Latin American writer should be writing about? And how do and if there are and if there are expectations, how do you navigate those expectations while still staying true to yourself as a writer? Yeah, I think there's a, there are many expectations. Some of them are category expectations. For example, um, Latin American writers or, and some other writers of color, but especially I've noticed it with Hispanic writers or writers of Latin American descent. Uh, there's an expectation that you write um, a lot of immigrant stories and especially immigrant suffering stories. And that is kind of considered the one experience that you're an expert on and the, that you can talk about and sort of nothing else. So if you want to, for example, write a romance, a, a, you know, saucy romance of some type, then there, there's the thought process that, well, you can't do that. You should stick to your lane and your lane is this type of story. And, and maybe they, you know, they think, oh, you can write magic realism, but it has to be quaint enough, that kind of stuff. And so if you want to write um, an epic space opera, uh, Star Wars-y like in your Latin American or uh, of Latin American heritage, then it becomes really a difficult conversation to have. There are also other kinds of expectations that are more uh, not genre related, but of the text itself. Sometimes I have people saying that there was not enough Spanish in my book, for example, 
which is very weird for me because whenever I read a French novel and then I read a lot of books in translation, it's not like every other word is, oh, I ate the croissant uh, in the very pretty table. And then I went and I got into my butcher and I drove all the way to, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. But when, but I have noticed it that, you know, for a Latin American author, that is this expectation that, you know, you put enough words in italics in the text to signify a certain kind of exotifying factor, possibly. Uh, there's also sometimes this notion that um, a book needs to be educational. So sometimes people will complain, it was not educational enough. I did not learn enough about Mexico or this or this part of Mexico. And, and so then it's like, I'm not a textbook, I'm not Wikipedia, I'm not an encyclopedia. Uh, why would you think that, you know, you, you don't think when you open a Stephen King book, you don't think, and you're reading it, you don't think, well, I'm going to get a history of clowns in this, in this novel, you just read this scary book. And so there's those kinds of expectations. And there's, and there's even more stuff that kind of pops in and, and crops into the picture. It's definitely not an equal space for that reason, because certain things that there are certain potholes that other writers don't have to face and that suddenly you discover that they're there and nobody told you there's that pothole. And then you go and you say, well, there's a pothole and somebody tells you what pothole and there's like this big gaping hole and you're like, uh, it's right there, I can see it. And it, it goes from, yeah, those things like uh, how readers treat a text um, in, and also some really weird things about marketing, how somebody is marketed or is not marketed. Um, a lot of conversations that I've had to have with my publishers have been about around covers and cover design. And there were points where they were giving me like a white person on the cover. And I was like, look, this lady is blonde. Like you can, we cannot have this blonde lady on the cover. And they were kind of like, well, you know, but, you know, it's, it's a fantasy cover. And I was like, well, I know it's a fantasy cover, but we cannot have this white lady on the cover. Um, and so those are things that have been kind of changing and uh, kind of getting better in the industry in the past few years. When I started, it was like, you couldn't find anybody of color on a cover of a spe speculative fiction novel. It was like zero, you, you go back when I started and it's like nobody. And then you see it popping up and more people. And now you do have more things going on in, ter in terms of that. But there's also always this fear of tokenization that I think uh, also happens and that happens too when when they tell you you're invited to the diversity panel and the diversity panel only right and you're like but I want to be on the noir panel I want to be on the crime fiction panel and they're like no your panel is a diversity panel so that has happened too so there's just like a, a lot of stuff a lot of things um, that you have to navigate and they're both and a lot of them are unspoken so you're kind of going in and and nobody's telling you this ahead of time and you're just suddenly kind of finding it out um, that uh, that this is the way business is done and, and this is the way things are done and you don't quite fit in very neatly in that, uh, in that, in that space. But that's also why I um, switched categories a lot too was because editors kept saying, you know, you're not like, you're unpublishable like we cannot publish you because we don't know how to market you. We don't know how this book fits. And so then I said, well, if I'm unpublishable, then I'll just do whatever I want, right? If there's no space for me, then I will just not stick to one category. I'll write all kinds of different books. I'll, uh, I'll bounce around in different modes. Um, I'll do whatever I want because of that kind of sense of like, you don't quite fit in. I was like, well, if I don't fit in, then I don't. And I'm just not going to try to be that kind that kind of writer but it but it's been um an interesting experience and i and just watching the evolution of both the writers that are appearing now and some of the editorial stuff behind the scenes is just really really interesting from when i started just how the landscape is kind of slowly shifting and morphing well, those, are, those are incredible insights into the industry and the type of situations that, you know, um, writers of color have to navigate in this industry that, you know, hopefully it'll get better uh, to move forward. Um, anybody else? 
Can you find Opa? Well, with that, Sylvia, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful. Um, to everybody that joined us, thank you all for joining and for being here. Uh, we want to um, remind you that we do have Sylvia's book here at the local library, so you can come check them out. Julie is holding a couple. I have a couple more over here. Uh, we have all of them. So if you want to come check them out, we have several copies. And I think we also have access to the ebook. Yes, so also on uh, Libby, we have um, Sylvia's books. And we have audio books as well. So we have different formats. And we do have a couple of them in Spanish um, as well. So if you um, would like that, so. Yeah, so. Look at our catalog, newbirdfreelibrary.org. <laughs> there they are for you. Sylvia, once again, thank you so much. And have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Well, that was fun.